welcome to this class on uh, nuisance of human movement. This is part 6 of uh, the discussion on primary motor cortex. So, in today's class, uh, the activity of a population of uh, neurons in M1 uh, in primary motor cortex. So, in the previous class or in one of the previous classes, we saw a population of neurons can predict the direction in which the monkey is trying to move. So, if I am if I am recording from a whole bunch of neurons, depending on their population activity, depending on the overall activity of all these neurons, I can predict what is the direction in which this uh, monkey is going to move. As in each neuron has a directional tuning curve or a preferred direction, summing all the activities of all these neurons at a given point in time will give you an approximate uh, prediction of the direction in which the movement is going to happen. This is the work of uh, Postulus Jajopoulos that we discussed in the previous class. In today's class, we will discuss something else. In today's class, we will discuss the instantaneous trajectories being predicted by uh, populations of neurons. So, we will discuss that. In the second topic, we will be discussing uh, how uh, the activity of uh, M1 neurons varies depending on the forces required to maintain the direction against external loads. So, in this case, in the previous case, what is the difference between the previous case and this case? In this case, uh, the monkey's movement is in a particular direction. Let us suppose the monkey is uh, moving in that direction. It is possible that there is no load that is acting that would have that would basically take you to the Jajopoulos experiment. Let us remind ourselves what this experiment is. This is the center out reaching task. So, there is a center and there are multiple targets. Okay. These are the targets. These are the various targets, is it not? So, if the reaching is a monkey is reaching to that point or to that point or to that point, for example, it could reach to any of these 8 targets. Now, if we are recording just the monkey's movement when there is no external load that is basically Jajopoulos's experiment. If I add an external load that either partially or completely opposes the movement, suppose the monkey is trying to make the movement toward the right like that or like that and the external load is acting in the opposite direction say what will happen. That means, you would expect that for the movement to happen, there will be a greater activity of these neurons. Is that happening? So, that is the second question. Okay. And the third question is about what happens when there is no real movement, but force is produced against a non moving object or isometric force production. Okay. So, these are the three things we would we want to discuss in today's class. So, Andy Schwartz and his colleagues they studied the activity of about 240 M1 neurons. So, this is nearly I think nearly 240 uh, neurons in the primary motor cortex of uh, live behaving monkeys. So, so, the movement trajectories that were required to be made were spirals. So, this is movement movement. This movement can be, uh, this spiral can be made from the outside to the inside as it is happening in A or from the inside to the outside as it is happening in B. In other words, I could, I could either do that, that is I am going from outside to the inside. In this case, the monkey is going from inside to the outside, is it not? So, there are two possibilities. These uh, the, so figures A and B represent the actual movement trajectories. Okay, from these movement trajectories, it is possible for me to decompose this into directions, instantaneous directions, and velocities. So, when I do that, I get a time series or a temporal sequence of uh, vectors. This is, so this is the temporal sequence that is time. So, I am going to get a time series of uh, vectors with the instantaneous directions and speeds encoded in them. So, and that is for the moment A and this is for the moment B. 
again this is uh, suppose uh, this is population activity okay this is for the movement a and this is for the movement b so that is for that one okay this is the decomposition of the actual uh, trajectory into the instantaneous directions and velocity vectors now from 240 neurons it is possible for me to get directional tuning curves like in the case of uh, plus and uh, that is found to be this approximately. So, I am recording from these neurons in simultaneously while movement is also being recorded is it not. So, from with these neurons their activity the instantaneous directions and the level of activity can be represented as vectors like in the case of Georgopoulos and uh, I can also arrange this as a time series as a temporal sequence like in this case. Now, I could use this to reconstruct a trajectory that could come out right. So, this is the population activity when the movement is A or when I am going from outside to the inside when the spiral is spiraling in right. So, this is the activity of the neurons this is population activity. Likewise, when you are going out from in I am recording activity and that is also uh, represented as instantaneous uh, uh, directions and velocities vectors right. From these vectors it is possible for me to reconstruct trajectories just like it is possible for me to decompose these trajectories into these or or more precisely this was uh, b is decomposed into the vector c and a is decomposed into this vector a is it not. Just like I have decomposed <coughs> the movement trajectories into these vectors I can also use these vectors to reconstruct trajectories theoretically and that was attempted. When that was attempted this movement activity for this activity of the neurons results in a trajectory such as this one and d results in a trajectory such as this one. Now, let us take a look and uh, see what happens. So, what was recorded actual movement trajectory was recorded and activity of 240 neurons in the primary motor cortex was recorded. From the activity of the 240 primary motor cortex neurons we are able to get the instantaneous directions and velocity vectors from which we are able to reconstruct the preferred the, the approximate trajectories those are given in C and D. So, this is the actual movement this is the prediction okay. C and D are predictions A and B are actual trajectories compare A and C for example, you will find that C is not an exact reproduction of A yet there is a striking resemblance is it not. So, I am able to I am not able to exactly reconstruct as it is in A because uh, A looks smooth and much more neat, but the reconstruction from neuronal activity is very similar it is not the same, but it is very similar I likewise for B and D right B and D if I compare D is not an exact reproduction of B, but it resembles very closely or at least there are many features that are very similar. So, from this we what we can conclude is that activity of a population of neurons predicts not just the force that needs to be produced not just the movement that need, but also the, the instantaneous uh, directions and velocities. So, they it are it, predi it predicts kinematics over time. The activity of neurons precedes the actual trajectories by about 100 milliseconds ok. And note one more thing uh, if I had units for these trajectories say this is you know the y axis this is the x axis and in centimeters this is uh, this is x in centimeters this is y in centimeters I am not going to be able to get these trajectories also in you know in centimeters. 
So, in other words, I am going to get characteristics that are similar, but not exact magnitudes. So, the characteristics are going to be strikingly similar, but uh, the exact magnitudes and units will not be similar because why? From velocities, I am decomposing into displacements. There are going to be some uh, errors that are going to be, that are going to arrive. So, I am not going to be able to exactly predict this mood by so many centimeters, but I can predict the approximate trajectory of movement. So, the the characteristic of movement I can predict. Okay. So, this is the work of. Uh, and Schwartz. So, this is a uh, Moran and Schwartz uh, 1999 thanks to our colleagues to for sharing sharing this data. Okay. So, next we discuss what happens when uh, the monkey is trying to move against uh, external loads. So, I said earlier in the Georgiopoulos experiment there was no load right the monkey is trying to make movements to the eight directions no load. Suppose, the monkey is making a movement and suddenly an external load is either assisting the movement or opposing the movement or opposing the movement in a certain different direction what could happen that is the question. So, here and what was found was that depending on the direction of force that is required right. So, depending on the load that is acting the direction of force that is required will change depending on the direction of force that is required the activity of the neurons does change. For example, here what is presented is the no load activity. Okay. So, when there is no load if the movement is in a particular direction. So, um, this is uh, the original position this is the home position from this point the monkey is required to move to that direction. The, the position of each of this group of uh, activity rep represents the position that was required to be moved. Okay. So, that is the position that was required to be moved for example, that was the target and the activity of these neurons predicts that direction. Likewise, this was the target and the activity of these neurons predicts that direction for example, and so on and so forth. Lo look, this is approximately a, a repetition of or a replication of the Jajopoulos experiment, but what is new in this experiment is what happens when the monkey is required to move against a load. Now, the load in this picture in B, the position the direction in which the load was pulling is what is represented here. So, this shows the direction in which it was pulling okay. not the target to be moved this is the direction in which it was pulling and I have to. So, in that case then the monkey is or its or its neurons are acting in the opposite direction. Likewise, the load is pulling in that direction is it not. So, that is the center the load is pulling in that direction the monkey's neurons are acting in the opposite directions. So, once again showing that uh, depending on the external load if I have to reach to a particular target or if I have to maintain the direction of a movement or a, of a movement then depending on the direction of the load the activity will change and it does change. Okay. So, this is again data from uh, Kalaska right once again we are thankful to our colleagues for this. Now, what about this is again activity of a population of neurons. Right. So, that was also the case with the previous Andy Schwartz and his group. What happens about what happens with individual neurons? Right. So, this is data from uh, Sergio and Kalaska. Right. So, here what is presented is uh, there is not actual movement this is the case of isometric force production or you have a you have a manipulandum you have an object that is immovable that is strongly fixed to a table and the monkey is given a cue as to which direction in which it is supposed to produce a force. It is trying to push this object in a particular direction, but it cannot push it because the object is fixed strongly let us suppose that is the case here. Now, I can push it in that direction I can push it in that direction I can push it in many different directions is it not. Now, this is uh, activity from a this picture presents activity from a single neuron. So, what about uh, this case what about the case of Kalaska 
this is a uh, activity from about 260 m1 neurons okay this picture whereas uh, this picture presents activity from a single neuron and uh, when the monkey is producing force in a particular direction there is maximal activity as seen by these and in the opposite direction there is very minimal activity then not so from this i can again reconstruct a directional tuning curve like in the case of uh, jajopoulos and that's shown here now let's discuss the fundamental differences between the jajopoulos experiment and this experiment in this experiment there isn't an actual movement in the jajopoulos experiment so there was a home position and there was a target there was actual reaching there was a change in kinematics in this case there is no change in kinematics the monkey is holding the object at the same position throughout the trial yet the activity change is representative of the direction in which it is pull it is pushing the object so the direction of the isometric force force that is being produced is uh, also uh, represented in a way that is somewhat similar to the direction of actual movements are in other words this is kinetics is it not this is kinetics why this is actual force production whereas jajopoulos experiment is reaching or generation of trajectories or kinematics so it seems that the neurons behave in approximately similar ways in both cases okay so this is data from uh, sergio and kalaska all right so from this what we have seen uh, from these studies is that uh, from the work of uh, andy schwartz we can say that depending on the population of uh, population activity of a uh, bunch of neurons we could predict the actual trajectories we could reconstruct the trajectories to some approximation in other words we can reconstruct the population vectors we can reconstruct the direction and instantaneous velocities and then using that we could reconstruct the displacement trajectories which will be approximately similar to the actual movement trajectories this is the work of andy schwartz then the work of uh, kalaska where depending on the external load direction the activity of a population of neurons will vary and uh, depending on the isometric force production direction so even if there is no real movement the direction of uh, force production the direction in which the force is produced on an object can be encoded or is uh, preceded by activity of uh, individual neurons in the primary motor cortex so with this we come to the end of this class we'll continue the lecture in future classes thank you